Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next edition. I think it's the seventy-first. I think um, of 70th. the seventieth of the Frankenstein chat. As you can see, um, we're we <laughs> we have a guest with us today. Hello, Jenny. Hi. Hi. It's lovely yeah. to have you with us. Um, I know you've been watching our videos yeah. uh, for uh, a few months, so it's great to have you. Yeah. Stan, you were going to smile, uh, laughing. Then was that? Yeah. Are you going to say something about? No, it's just I remember say, saying to Jenny when she said that she was she was watched several. I said you need to see a psychologist. <laughs> and it turns out you didn't need to see one. Yeah, no, I felt really really interesting, really useful as well. Definitely in my yeah in my work. So yeah, good, good. And, um, and we've had a big compliment this week, haven't we, from somebody who said that the uh, they feel this is like um, gone fishing. <laughs> God, yeah, we. are <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean i never i ne we never started off to to, to achieve this done but uh, it's nice though that it, it i mean i i regularly get people come up to me and say oh i think i've seen you and then aren't you the frankenstein um but it's great that uh, our little witterings each week seem to sort of strike a chord so uh jenny there, there may be one or two people who don't know who you are so can you just explain to them who you are yeah, of course. Cool. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, my name's Jenny Mulleno. I'm a clinical psychologist. So, I, uh, I specialize in working with children and young people and their families and systems around them. Um, I work for an organization um, called Changing Minds. So, we're a, a group of psychologists that I guess support, um, you know, working to local authorities, charities, um, lots of other services really um, and before that I worked for a number of years within the NHS within the um, two separate uh, child psychology teams so um so when yeah. did you know that you wanted to go down this field oh well um I so I yeah I had a little bit of a kind of um a strange route really so I once I'd done my undergraduate degree I kind of came out of that ended up working at Lancashire at County right. Council um, and um, actually ended up in a role working in um, extended services. So, um, it, yeah, back sort of like probably quite a few years ago now, it was a Labour government agenda, wasn't it? And yeah. uh, sort of working with, with schools, supporting them to develop their um, kind of family support, their community support, really enjoyed that. And then um, moved into working with children that were looked after and um, their social workers and carers and um, providing support. And at the time I was working with a psychologist, yeah, a fantastic psychologist by uh, named Jane Logie. And um, she kind of said, you've got a psychology degree, haven't you? What are you doing with that? And I said, oh. <laughs> Well, nothing really at the moment it's kind of helpful but I've not really kind of taken that any further and she said you know I really think we should kind of think about how we support you onto your clinical training and um so she really so, was so, she's the reason why you're here isn't she she is absolutely and um clinical psychology training is kind of quite notoriously difficult to um to get onto simply because there aren't many places so I hadn't really kind of entertained that idea but um managed to kind of somehow get on a course and yeah that's wow. So yeah. that interest in, in psychology, was that started at A-level at, at school or college? Yeah, yeah, definitely at A-level. Um, and then, yeah, I, I enjoyed it most at A-level. What I found when I went to university is that somehow it suddenly got separated from anything to do with what <laughs> felt like human experience. <laughs> it suddenly became really quite academic, um, yeah. didn't have any placements, didn't really leave with a very good understanding of, if, if I'm honest, what kind of a psychologist might do and what their work might be. And then... When I started to have some experience of that just through work, um, I thought, actually, yeah, this is something that I could really see myself doing. So, and then one of your previous guests, Mark Borden, um, yes. who is a good friend of, 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 of mine and, and my dad's that you also had on as a guest, um, we kind of got chatting about it as well. So, yeah, a few it's sort like, of different influences, really. Yeah, my daughter studied A level uh, psychology, but when she went to uni and she's got a psychology degree, it was the the statistics element of it that I think saw off some of the other students, you know, that, that, but she was reasonably good at mathematics, so she coped with it. But there were other students who 
just yeah. found that leap into the the undergraduate world really challenging and, and and actually turned some of them off the subject i think yeah absolutely i can definitely relate yeah. to that i can like scrape through those parts of my degree. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway okay so let's get on then to what's caught your eye this week stan <clears throat> uh, well I, i've just the white shirts because i've just rushed back from a, a funeral <clears throat> um of a, a colleague that i worked with uh about 40 years ago in, in truth um and there was a meeting then of, of people who taught around the same time so again linked to what we said last week it's that connection with people that i probably only worked with for 12 months but yet you sit down in the room 40 years later and mm. it's as though you've started the same conversation so there was lots of conversations about what teaching used to be like um lots of people pointing fingers saying maybe you weren't as good as you thought you were <laughs> <Probably true. laughs> I <can cope> that. <laughs> very accurate uh but the, the the thing that stuck with me and thing that's caught my eye is is that the the sort of donations for the funeral were to Salford children's holiday camp which is when i worked in Salford, which was somewhere that we took children for a holiday not not um learning well learning in a different sense not work it was mm -hmm. literally a seaside holiday and it goes back to the 1930s i think the camp it was originally known as uh, salford's poor children's holiday camp which is hard to sell to some of the more affluent mm -hmm. schools and then it became known colloquially as the jam butty camp because uh, that's what you got for your tea on a saturday i think, <laughs> I think that's what happened um, but we were talking about its place in in a modern modern setting for education, and actually, uh, one of the people who's been very sort of busy and still I think is still in, involved in in keeping the money because it's it's run by a charity. It's it's self funded. Was saying it's the space. It's this wide open space that's grass followed by sand dunes followed by the beach that the children from the most disadvantaged areas just love the space the mm. green space the running about space the able to do what i want space that probably is something they don't have and it's a very safe environment for that kind of activity yeah, yeah. now I, I know mm. i used to go years ago and it was always a full week which is exhausting <laughs> <laughs> but again it's for some children at the time it was probably the only time they had away and when I went to a more affluent school and I suggested it and the parents were sort of the, the poor children's holiday camp. We don't we don't do things like that here. And they would say, but we go to, to France and we go to Spain. And I always used to say, yeah, but your children don't get the opportunity to mix with their yeah. cohort yeah. In, in a dormitory. And all the experiences that that gives you as a child, it, it, you can't match that with a holiday in Spain. Mm. And I still believe that. And I, Obviously, I've been prompted today with lots of, of reminders of, of just seeing children really enjoy themselves and get beyond their, their daily routines in a short period of time. And I, I think we should be looking at more support like that. that, that mm. It's something I just think I've always thought was the right thing to do. I still find it amazing when we take the grandchildren or even our children and we go to the beach, you don't even need a bucket and spade. It's amazing. You know, you, you do childcare at home with your grandchildren and you're, you're not, I don't mean frazzled, but you, you think, oh, what are we going to move on to next? You know, whereas with the beach, you, you, you know, they, they can be anywhere, can't they? They could be in, they, they could imagine they're in Paris. They can imagine they're on the moon. Mm. It, it, you know, all of that is just available to them. They're not, you know, we're not restricting them. They're, they're able to take their world to wherever they want it to be. What about you, Jenny? What's caught your eye this week? Um, so I guess what's caught my eye, there's, lots, there's been lots, hasn't there, in the news. Um, I think one of the things that's particularly caught my eye was around um, kind of Keir Starmer's speech, really, and um, within that, making reference to, um, you know, Labour planning to um, increase, I guess, mental health support and increase the number of mental health specialists and, and, and fund more mental health services in it. I guess whenever that sort of thing comes up in the news, it always gets me thinking about our responses, I think, to um, the emotional well-being of our young people and sort of connected to that, how we understand their kind of mental health and what they need and, um, and often kind of um, sort of 
what I tend to kind of feel a bit sort of um, concerned about, I think, is um, how we can get overly focused, I guess, on kind of individualised approaches to supporting mm. our young people. And I was really struck by what Stan was saying there, because, you know, that really kind of spoke to me in terms of my experience of being a psychologist, that actually what we know about resilience, what we know about um, kind of um, what what supports young people with their mental health is, is all of that stuff that you described there. And um, the, the term that comes to mind for me, I think is, you know, is ordinary magic. And I think that's something that, um, that's a nice yeah, a, a, yeah. yeah a, a research called our Maston talks about, it's the idea that actually time and time again within research, the same kind of factors continue to come up and that's around, you know, access to safe, supportive relationships, good friendships you know, a sense mm. of belonging and activities and all of those things that kind of are the engines of resilience, really. And I think, um, you know, it's so important. We, I think we lose sight of that sometimes. We we get overly focused on, you know, what particular treatments we can provide to our, our young people. And it just sort of separates them, I think, sometimes from, from, from their experience. And I think, yeah, that kind of... Yeah. Well, I would say... ...connected that there, really those kind of experiences change the relationship between the teacher and the children if only for a, a short period but but it makes something that lasts forever because it builds some memories in about how you, you know as a child how I and the teacher interacted when we were hiding on the dunes from the rest who were coming looking for it's it's a different relationship yeah, it's part of a longer relationship and and I I just think as I said last week after doing the outdoor stuff it's seeing children grow in a very short period of time because they're in a different environment and and often I find my experience is that the children that don't grow as quickly in a school environment blossom when mm -hmm. when you go into uh, a different environment where there's a bit more freedom and a bit it, it's safe but it, it there's a bit more freedom yeah Absolutely. I mean I I I, I think um, I mustn't forget what's caught my eye, but um, the the issue here was around um, when we were at the beginning of the first lockdown in March 2020. I've said this story before, but um, Henry Morrison, who's the director of the Northern Powers Partnership, phoned me up and said, "Well, what are we going to do about that?" And I thought, "I've absolutely no idea." But one thing that struck me was if the lockdown was for any length of time some children would i had the feeling that some children would find it difficult just to reintegrate mm. possibly because of their you know not value not not trying to value laden their experience but that their experiences may be different you know that the experiences that the the young people would experience would would, would vary and mm. i felt as though what we needed was more of um we needed to have people who had been trained in schools to support that reintegration of relationships you know to yeah. me it was never around it was never around oh how much mathematics have they lost or how much reading have they missed you know it was always about how can we how can we enable these young people to feel supported and helped in sort of the human bit of it you know yeah. not you know okay we can get on with the learning a little bit later on but for me it was always around those relationships and so the work we were talking before that you, you've been in some Sheffield schools recently yeah. and, and, and the paper that we that I wrote and was developed went to the DFE and turned from mentoring into tutoring and the tutoring then I you know it was it became something completely different mm -hmm. um, and I'm not surprised that the tutoring element of it has really struggled to take off but actually, I'm really pleased because you were saying that you were in some Sheffield schools where it looks as though the Grow Mentoring Programme, which is being run out of Sheffield oh, okay. University, looks as though it's had some mileage in, in a particularly interesting school that you've been in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this particular school that I've been in, um, you know, the needs of the population um, that they support, you know, it's a, a community with really high levels of disadvantage, very high levels of mobility. Um, you know, and, and 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 high levels of trauma within the community mm. and and for many of the children that come into school. And I think that whole idea around connection and, and safety within relationships is absolutely central. And not just because it's important for mental health, but because those are the sort of those those are the key things that are going to support a child's engagement in school and in learning. And without them, then 
they're not going to be able to do their maths or their English, are they? Because they're feeling sort of disconnected or unsafe. So it's great to see that schools are really thinking about how they um, respond in these ways, I think. So and really keep relationships at, at the heart of things. It's part of the reason why I moved out of sort of kind of NHF. So I've got to be careful here, but you know, there's some amazing work that goes on yes. in the NHS. But mm. also, I think, you know, in terms of, I don't think we get to support those relationships enough. You know, if we're sitting within services that have 18 month waiting lists and, you know, we're seeing children for one hour a week, we're not supporting those no. people, are we, that are trying to connect and develop relationships with children on a day to day basis. And actually, it's those things that are going to make the key difference. So it's, that's really interesting because actually it, it, it does open up questions about training of teachers mm. in, in relationship building. I, I can't ever remember um being taught how to develop a relationship with um a child who's experienced some traumatic event mm -hmm. now i'm sure there is some training going on but i'm just saying i didn't i never experienced yeah i mean frank <laughs> I know. But, you know, but it was it but also you know thinking about some people are very good at creating relationships you know i i think i'm i was talking to my wife this morning i think i'm particularly good at doing no that's steady is stuff that, is that the same connection <laughs> i'm particularly good at making relationships i was even talking to my wife today <laughs> but i'm i'm good on the uh, i think i'm confident at sort of meeting people for the first time and then sort of breaking the ice with them but actually i don't think i am really patient enough to continue with that discussion you know I, I'm moving on to the next but, but my wife is the one who can come in she's often very nervous about meeting people for the first time but then she's she's with them you know she's really engaged and then it's always me trying to pull her away from those discussions you know so it's as if um I, you know I my skill set is in a certain field I actually think I need sort of development in how do I develop that sort of relationship where she's got that but hasn't got the breaking the ice type thing and we've never ever you know thought about how can we support people to be able to you know mm. to develop these relationships and to actually sort of show that they are you know i don't know how, how you actually you know yeah. might never got to break the ice how do we help them break the ice yeah. how do people like me who can't keep it going for how do we help him you know develop yeah. those relationships but don't, don't you think frank that some of that time that that teachers would would develop that relationship with their class and with with individuals in the class has just been squeezed out of the mm. of the curriculum completely. Well, it's all in the it's all in the learning. Is it, well, the learning as if the learning has got to be academic or it's got to be related to a performance thing. It was interesting. Um, I was listening to Lem Cisse last night at the Winter Gardens in Blackpool because he launched this uh, Blackpool Literacy Initiative. It's it's about it's for the whole town trying to get everybody to just to read a little bit more in the, uh, in their lives. But Lem Cisse said. There are, there are some very dangerous people out there and they're called data killers. And what he meant by that was just this overemphasis on data, which is very helpful. Data is very helpful. But when you overemphasize it, it kills everything. Mm. Absolutely. You know, and, and I think it's so... Sorry, Frank. Go, no, go on, on, Jenny. I was just going to say, I think that's so important because, um, you know, I agree. And I think sometimes we can get very, very focused on the evidence base and doing things in line with the evidence base. And yet what, what we're talking about here is very, very difficult to capture within kind of the ways that we usually capture data and evidence. You know, how do you capture something as subjective as a child's sense of trust yes. in you as a member of staff or how safe they feel within school? And so because we struggle to capture that, it then doesn't get, um, it doesn't get an evidence base in the same way that maybe sort of six sessions of a particular standardized approach would get. And then people look at that and go, well, we need to do more of that standardized approach because it's got an evidence base, but actually we know that that other stuff is so important. It's so important. We know it, our clinical experience tells us it is, you know, theoretically we know that it is, but we can't capture it in the same way. So we definitely agree with that. But a series of, sorry, Stan. You... No, I was just going to say, but my issue, is, uh, one of the issues at the moment is that we're pushing and pushing uh, in the DfE and, and in schools for um, evidence-based and research-based practice. And I just, I just worry that, that we miss in that that um off the off the, the cuff 
relationship building, mm. the, yeah. the inspirational teacher. I, I'm not saying research is, is something we shouldn't do. We should do, but it's not putting trust in everything that can be researched. I know the old one that we, we value what we measure rather than measure what we value. And, mm -hmm. and, and that I think is, is more true now than it's ever been that if we can count it or if we can add it or if we can make a statistic out of it, it becomes something we can use to measure progress, measure schools, etc. And like you say, just measuring how much more confident a child is jumping in a, in a waterfall three days into to activity, you can't do. I mean, but if you saw that child's face, you could put a big tick in progress. Mm but not the progress that makes the school better. Well, I, I'm, I was, one of the things that I was reviewing this week is um, a, a, an educational researcher, you know, basically was dissing lots of this. And he used the term, I think I've got to look at, pedag pedagogue in mimicry or something, pedag pedag pedagimicry. And basically what he was saying was that, you know, it, it's very, very difficult, you know, to actually, evaluate learning and you know by trying to look at this in data terms it sort of downplays the complexity of it mm. and basically just allows you to measure in the easiest areas and ignoring the stuff yeah. that Stan's talking about and the thing that you were mentioning mm. you know and actually therefore it then gets ahead of steam and you think well we're heading towards the silver bullet folks you know and, and the, the people that are suffering from this are the poor kids, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. yeah, so, I but, mean, I, the... I was just going to say, Jenny, if, if we gave you the, the yeah, million know. dollar yeah. um, question now and say, so if it was down to you, how, how would schools best support children's emotional development? How would they do it? Well, I, can I just say, how would they... It's not just emotional yeah. development, is it? No, well, their it's, development then. Their development, because actually, yeah. I think we've got to cut into this sort of, it's all got to be about the learning, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's a that's a huge question, I guess. I guess for me, it's about, you know, certainly the, the schools that I've worked with, um, what is so difficult to capture around this is it's different for every school because every school sits within a different community, doesn't it? And I think we've got to be able to trust in our schools to yeah. understand their own community and the needs of their own children and to, um, you know, so, so if, I'm, if I'm sat with a school, we think of the things that are important to them, you know, important to their community, what are the particular challenges of their community? Um, and then we work from that point and we build from that point. Um, and as a psychologist, I then bring in some of the kind of, I guess, some of the psychological understanding around, for example, you know, how a child has experienced particular um, events or trauma or whatever, some of the challenges that they might present within school and what they might need from, from the whole school, you know, the relationships with staff, the opportunities, you know, to engage with other people, whatever that might be. So I think for me, it's, it's a whole school approach. It's got to be a bespoke approach. Yeah. You know, there isn't a kind of one size fits all approach that works for every school. It's got to be developed, you know, with, with all of that in mind, really. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, what I would say is that relationships have to sit at the heart of that, you know, in terms of relationships between children and, and teachers, but also relationships that teachers have, you know, with senior leaders and the Absolutely. relationship between yeah. the school and the community, because for children to feel safe and secure in school, um, you know, the, their families have to feel that sense of trust, don't they? And mm. but that, that runs also, doesn't it, with the school's relationship with government? Absolutely. You know, yeah. in a way, we can't have it where we're cocooned in, a, in, a, in an environment where the, there is a, a truly trusting relationship. And obviously that needs to be tested now and again. I mean, you know, because it is mm. open to abuse. But but actually, we can't have it, therefore, that actually we have that that type of relationship and then a completely sort of more authoritarian relationship imposed on that school, you know, because that will sort of feed into that, the sort of will harm, I think, a bit like yeah, will harm the, the underlying or make it even more difficult to establish those, you know, firm, supportive, encouraging relationships that we're after. Absolutely. And I think, unfortunately, 
a lot of the kind of messages from the government are around, you know, in terms of behaviour management, are oh, just, you know, have lots mm, of issues I, with, with what it, that looks like. And, and I think, you know, schools can get themselves understandably into quite a lot of difficulty because they're ineffective. Um, and, and, you know, for, for some of our, our young people, they need something different. And that's, you know, it's not about saying that, you know, limits and boundaries and aren't important. Yeah. They're absolutely fundamental. Um, you know, that's how our children feel safe. But at the same time, you know, sometimes I feel like schools are being encouraged to use practices which just are not, no. you know, they're just not helpful. <laughs> so... <laughs> sometimes we don't even talk to the children, do we, about, about it? I mean, I remember part of what I was doing at one point was interviewing some some students who'd been excluded. And what, one girl said, well, I was excluded for non-attendance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who's, is it what she said was, whose bright idea was that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you know. And, it, you know, for, for young people that have experienced some level of trauma in their lives, often exclusion is such a key theme yeah. within that. So if yeah. we start to get involved in that, it ends up then kind of, you know, inadvertently repeating and, you know, cycles that they've experienced, which are, you know, potentially quite traumatic, really. So I think there has to be, you know, there has to be a different way. And that, for me, that's that's got to be about kind of equipping staff with that understanding, yeah. you know, young people that, are you know experienced trauma you know can be very difficult to relate to they've developed patterns of relating and behaving to keep themselves safe that often mean that they can present with behavior that's really really challenging and you know i think the teachers you know that can often feel very personal it can feel very difficult and it can be difficult to empathize with a young person that is chucking chairs around or shouting hurtful comments at you and if you aren't supported to understand why that's happening then you know, for staff that can get very, very stressful and um, and difficult. So I think there has to be some intervention there for staff, doesn't there, to help them yeah. to understand that and support children. For me, this is all about the culture of the, of the school and, and the relationship between staff is is a cultural thing that affects, mm. uh, from my view, affects children. And I, I was reading somewhere about what somebody answering the question, "What are schools for?" And actually, one of the things I read was was it's about providing children and young people with a culture that they that they can grow with mm -hmm. and and anchor themselves to. And I think mm -hmm. that's really really important. And I think we've possibly lost that. I'm not sure if we ever sat you know in, in the 70s sat down and said what's our school culture. I don't think that was ever part yeah. of it. But that you know I think in some of the schools I've worked in. I know there were very different cultures and I've seen culture change in some of those schools mm. and I know when the relationships are right with the staff then relationships with the children were so much better mm -hmm. I can think of a school in in the middle of Salford that I taught in where uh, when I first joined nothing to do with me this I'm not saying I fixed any of this but when I joined it it was regular not unusual to have fights at lunchtime dinner time children you know arranging fights by the time I left, we had no no record of, of a fight or falling out or anything. And this was in a, a tough area. But it was I think it was because the relationship that built within the staff meant that it was no longer acceptable. And the children gained from that. Mm -hmm. They understood it and, and they were better. They reacted with each other better. I have to say, it might well have been the school being an island at the time because, you know, I remember once trying to get cricket going and saying... Yeah, take some cricket stuff home and, and play at night. And they said, oh, we can't because I can't go on his street. We're not, you know, we're on a different street. We're not allowed to go on his street because their gang will beat us up. Mm. Hang on, your mate's in school. Yeah, but not, no, not on the right. streets. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting listening to Lem Cisse last night, the point you were making there, Jenny. I think he, he his, I've heard him speak four times now and he's trying to cleanse himself by talking to others he, he, he says well i'm sharing this because i think it's important you hear it and yeah okay but it's how he feels about himself and yeah. his and the pain he has felt in his childhood um is actually providing him with a career at the moment mm -hmm. um but actually it's as much about him trying to rid himself of it you know by talking about it, it feels as though it's like something in him he's coughing it up sort of thing mm -hmm. and and i have to say uh 
uh, it did make me think very hard yesterday again about um, you know if we're not serving the the most troubled children in our schools we're not serving them you know because yeah. actually if we can't get that right there's no way that the you know the kids that have got everything going for them you know they might they might get a great education but it's at the expense isn't it of mm -hmm. those who haven't got that opportunity you know and it does make you feel as though well you know forget inspection and forget all the league tables but just focus in on these children and you'll probably see fundamental improvements in the system in any case you know because oh, suddenly okay. people will be more aware more focused on those that need the help and it'll be more equitable as well in terms of what we provide yeah absolutely absolutely and i think you know i think similarly you know certainly in in the health service um you know whilst you know whilst there is great work that's happening there i think for our most vulnerable children and young people there you know that that way that that sort of model of care just is just, just it's, you know it's it, it's inaccessible for them isn't it you know if you think what you need to get to cams for example you need yes. someone to take you to a gp you need then someone to take you to appointments you need to attend all of your appointments otherwise you might get discharged you know and you know for some of our young people and the circumstances that they live within and you know that's just that's too many too many barriers isn't it it's too many steps to jump through so you know i think if we are going to support you know those particular young people it's about us all working together isn't it and yeah. you know recognizing where they have those relationships and supporting those people to be able to sustain them and kind of and, and care for young people in the best way and i think um you know that's yeah i would agree i mean i believe it or not, we've had 31 minutes oh so this goes so quickly but yeah, how nice. optimistic are you how, how, i mean you you actually i see some schools I think your your range of schools and the places you visit is far greater than Stan and myself at the moment. So, what does it feel like at the moment for you? Um, I feel like we need. Well, you know, I, I kind of come back a little bit to my extended services days. I think at the time that I was an extended services officer, I didn't truly appreciate the value of what was happening. And I think, you know, moving forward, I think if we have a government that is prepared to be imaginative and is prepared to think actually you know we need to shift some of the we need to shift some of the attention here in the focus you know we need to be really getting it right in those key early developmental years we need to be giving families the best chance of you know providing these relationships for their children from the get-go I think that's your investment right there and that will have a knock-on effect on rates of mental health issues with our young people whether or not i think this government is prepared to do it in that way i'm not if i'm honest i'm not confident isn't it isn't it too much like... to give too much detail about no. his intentions but that would be my hope that that actually we'd move back towards a model that um that thinks a little bit more in that way so Have you just described the the underpinning of sure start and every every child have, matters agenda. absolutely and that's the, isn't it a real shame that everybody knows that that's where we need to get to yeah and actually in Blackpool, we're trying to do that, not secretly, but um, but we're trying to create that sort of structure again. But actually we could do so much more if the whole system was committed to that sort of agenda. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Well, yeah. God, it goes so quickly. It does, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, well, we'd love to have you back, Jenny. I feel as though yeah. we just scratched the surface here yeah no thank you for having me it's been uh, it's been a yeah it's been a privilege to finally come on a frankenstein chat after watching so many of them <laughs> no, we, we feel we feel privileged that people like you do, are willing yeah. to give half an hour of their time to talk to us so thank you very much for that and uh we'll we'll uh, hopefully all being well we'll be back next week i think actually stan we've got our first married couple as guests next week <laughs> all right so uh, it's a mr and mrs Not your wife is it now frank no 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 mrs <laughs> no you've formed a relationship with her <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's going to come on and talk how she can maintain her relationships better than i can um but no uh, we've got two head teachers who are married who are coming on next week so uh Anyway, Jenny, it's lovely to Look speak to you. To that. Thank you yes, very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, all being well, folks, we'll see you all next week. So goodbye from us. Bye-bye. Yeah.